Welcome to Matters Financial and Geopolitical from a Frontier, and I trust the week's gone well, and my, they fly by. Um, it was a pleasure catching up yesterday with Patrick Quarko, and in a rather fancy new corner office, Patrick is a friend and is the founder uh, of Radio Africa Group, which includes a number of radio stations, um, Classic, Kiss, uh, um, XFM, the Asian Channel as well, and the newspaper for which I write, The Star, and also um, uh, and, and also Kiss TV. And he's got some good ideas on that front that I had a chance to have a look at. Um, and he's a Ghanaian, extremely mercurial character. And um, uh, it's always fun spending some time with him. Um, I also got him to try the Jaguar JLR uh, 007. Um, I'll put up a photograph of him in Sanjeev and that, and of course that was the same Jaguar that was taken up to the Safari Lower Marathon, and uh, Dr. Turner has taken a spin in it as well, and I'll finally put up a photograph of it um, on the way to Lower, and it really was a fantastic sight. It's got this incredible growl, which is, uh, it just sort of rumbles through your body. Um, so it's a lot of fun actually, I quite enjoy it, I'm enjoying myself with that. Home thoughts, I go back to Salman Rushdie. Ours is the most cryptic of centuries. It's true nature, a dark secret. I like this photograph of elephants uh, from Old Pajeta. How many elephants do you spot? And uh, Have a look and tell me. And then I came across a song which I'd heard a long time ago when I watched this movie. It's John Voight in Midnight Cowboy. Everybody's talking. It's such a beautiful song. I've, been, I've, had, I've had it on a feedback loop for the last sort of six hours. Political Reflections, the representative of the US Intelligence Services, the CIA, at the Embassy of the United States of America has been requested to leave Germany, said a government spokesman, Stefan Seibert. So that continues. I, I noticed Angela Merkel was quite emollient in her comments. Um, she said, there's so many problems in the world, she doesn't understand why allies should be spying on each other, which was a nice way of saying it. John Kerry hits out at Chinese cyber spying. Instances of cyber theft have harmed our business and threatened our nation's competitiveness, Kerry said. The loss of intellectual property through cyber spying has a chilling effect on innovation and investment. Then he said China and the United States represent the greatest economic alliance trading partnership in the history of mankind, and it is only going to grow, he's told a breakfast meeting of prominent Chinese and American business leaders on Thursday morning. Business is a backbone of the China-U.S. economic relationship, so China's state councillor Yan Jiechi also at the same meeting. I'll put up a photograph of John Kerry meeting with China's President Xi Jinping and the Vice Premier in the Great Hall of the People. The Speaker of the National Assembly in Zambia, Patrick Matibini, yesterday told Parliament there is no cause for speculation on the whereabouts of President Sata because government has announced that he is in Zambia. I highly doubt that. Two-thirds of the world's population will live in cities by 2050. Um, at this, uh, at, and this poses, of course, unique infrastructural challenges for Africa and, and Asian countries. Africa is projected to experience a 16% rise in its urban population by 2050 making it the most rapidly urbanizing region on the planet as the number of people living in its cities soars to 56 percent. The report predicts that there will be 40 mega cities worldwide by 2050, each with a population of at least 10 million. Delhi, Shanghai, Tokyo predicted to remain the world's most populous cities in 2030 when each is projected to be home to more than 30 million people. Several decades ago, most of the world's largest urban agglomerations were found in the more developed regions. But today's large cities are concentrated in the global south. The UN says the fastest growing urban agglomerations are medium-sized cities and cities with fewer than one million inhabitants located in Asia and Africa. Um, I found this photograph via BBC World of Nouriel Maliki. I'll put it up. 
He really is a sort of fairly sticky sort of fellow, not much different to Assad, I suspect. Kenya's coastal killings pose insurgency risk for Kenyatta. This is Edmund Blair in, uh, the, the, on Reuters. Kenya may face a full-blown insurgency on its coast unless President Kenyatta can douse a combustible mix of ethnic rivalries, land rows, and Islamist militancy. Gunmen have killed about 100 people since mid-June, exposing festering problems that could test Kenyatta's ability to reassure a nation fretting about wider security a little more than a year into his first term. Despite dozens of arrests, the government has yet to identify the culprits. We have a serious radicalization threat, said Rashid Abdi, a specialist on Kenya and the Horn of Africa, who sees the beginning of a coastal insurgency supported by regional Islamists and other groups playing on local grievances. Investors have so far been unperturbed, piling into Kenya's debut eurobond, more than four times oversubscribed, even as bodies were counted on the coast. If the government fails to stop those driving the attacks and address local grievances, Kenyatta's promise to lift already stuttering growth may start to look empty. This is a serious challenge now. Chilling message scrawled on a wall in Lamu town and um, reads Boko Haram in Dio in Gia, which means Boko Haram is the way. Kenyatta's administration facing criticism for mishandling an Islamist attack on a Nairobi shopping mall last year says it is chasing down the culprits of recent assaults and has security under control. Um, that's what they are saying. Political opponents accuse the government of relying on heavy-handed police tactics and in playing politics instead of addressing the real causes. The situation on security is worrying and that adds to the impression that he may not be in charge in control of the whole thing, said Macharia Munene, professor at Nairobi's USIU. Um, I think he needs to take a deep breath, stop talking too much and be seen to take action. That's his Munene again. Somalia's Al-Shabaab Islamists said they were behind their attacks. This is in Lamu County. Um, Al-Shabaab say such attacks are revenge for Kenya's deployment of troops against its forces in neighboring Somalia. But Kenyatta, in, and rather incredibly, dismissed the claim this time and blamed local political networks. And in fact, on Radio Andalus, which is what the Al-Shabaab used to get their message out, the Al-Shabaab spokesman said this is the first time we've claimed responsibility for something and people are telling it's not us. Experts, diplomats and police suggest a confluence of factors at work which do not preclude Somali-linked Islamists with help from disgruntled local players. One Western diplomat said senior officials privately noted Al-Shabaab appeared to have had a role, but he said he was not sure the government of Kenya knows how to react. Aides insist Kenyatta has intelligence backing his assertion that politicians are to blame and, he, and say he has the issue in hand. B uh, uh, Munyori Buku, uh, Presidency's Senior Communications Director, said security forces would have the problem wrapped up in the next few days and weeks. Opponents, however, said the comments by Kenyatta and ethnic Kikuyu were political point scoring against Odinga. Aluo has been whipping up crowds with anti-government rallies. It is a high-stakes row in a nation where politics and ethnic loyalties are intertwined, a toxic brew that has erupted in violence in the past. Kenyatta should have cooled his heels and acted like a statesman, said one diplomat. Singling out politicians also runs the risk of ignoring the grievances that can be exploited by Islamist advocates of militancy or successionists, like the Mombasa Republican movement. Traditional coastal people have long complained of neglect by central government and dispossession, in point of fact. Um, and favoritism towards more recent arrivals in the region, including Kikuyus, who originally come from uplands in the center of the East African country. We are here like second-class citizens, even though we are indigenous to the area, 62-year-old Muslim preacher Mahmoud Abdul Qadir told Reuters. <coughs> land ownership is a major grumble. Coastal people say they are treated as squatters on ancestral land, with no formal documents where newcomers have been given title deeds. Government denies bias. Experts say the complaints run back decades to when Kenyatta's father was president after independence in 1963, and even to British colonial times. Indeed, they do. Coastal killings have left many Kikuyus among the dead, may have aimed to touch a nerve in State House in Nairobi. Pekatoni was known as a mostly Kikuyu town. That's why we got all that propaganda about Christians. 
They seem to be determined to break down the president emotionally by taking the war right to his doorstep, said one police force source who asked not to be named. And saying and Sheikh Jumangal, the chairman of the Kenya National uh, Kenya Muslim National Advisory Council, said police action built resentment. All these issues angered many of the radical Muslims, and what we are seeing in Lamu could be revenge combined with the historical issues about resources, then you have a full-blown problem. While the public frets, the government can take solace that investors have so far taken security worries in their stride. I've spoken about that severally. Um, and this applies to Nigeria as well, where the stock market has rallied sharply to a 2008 high in, this, in a similar period where actually the news about Boko Haram has been, has been even more intense. But I was taught to call this a bifurcation between what's happening on the ground and the capital markets. Um, the tourist industry may have taken a beating. It has indeed. Analysts say handing out title deeds needs to move faster. If you had an insurgency, it would probably change investors' perceptions of Kenya and the risks associated with investing here markedly. That's the regional economist at CFC. And I wrote on the 3rd of September about this. I said, you know, the Swahili coast is a potential tinderbox from Lamu through Zanzibar and all points in between. Um, I spoke about the security situation when I wrote that piece, the dashboard is blinking amber. Don DeLillo writes in Point Omega, when you strip away services, when you see into it, what's left is terror. This is the thing that literature was meant to cure, the epic poem, the bedtime story. There is an enormous conversation and hullabaloo going on, and we search this for signals, and the signal is very loud and clear and unanimous. We are being spun an epic poem, the bedtime story, and I said disbelief can be suspended, of course, but eventually we reach a Marx Brothers in duck soup moment. Well, who are you going to believe, me or your own eyes? And if you mind social media like I do, you will know you will know that duck soup moment was crossed during Westgate, and continuing resolutely down this path is eroding political capital. Then I quoted Gladwell: "Look at the world around you; it may seem like an immovable, implacable place. It is not. With the slightest push, in just the right place, it can be tipped." I'm going to put up a photograph of the setting sun in Lamu taken about four years ago. Another one of the sunset on Mombasa Island on Boxing Day last year. A video link for the time when we met some dolphins on the way to Wasini Island. And there's a fellow in Lamu I've met who's promised to take Hannah and myself swimming with them. But right now is obviously not the opportune time. I'll put up a photograph of Hannah on the beach of Galukinondo on the south coast. And finally a photograph of the ferry. Um, each time I sit there, I feel hopeless and exposed because you have an enormous crush of people. Um, and then in 2012, September, I wrote this, coast problems are deeper than riots. I said, we have to deal with a situation which has a number of vectors. There is a sense of disenfranchisement and disempowerment, a sense that the Pwani has not been <coughs> in a win-win deal with the centre, and this evidently applies all along the Swahili coast, from Lamu through Mombasa, where the MRC slogan, Pwani Si Kenya, is all over the walls in Ligoni. We have to create a sense of empowerment and enfranchisement, otherwise the likes of Abu Drogo will always have fertile ground in which to spin their tales of glorious martyrdom. My concern remains that what might appear like uncorrelated spikes and paroxysms of violence conflate become more broad-based and amplified. We need to create a roadmap that effects economic trickle-down because whilst all our eyes were turned towards the Rift Valley, the Pwani has been simmering. It needs our full attention. That was in 2012. Apparently, overnight attackers raided a coastal village in Lama County and stole police guns. Now to the awful scenes from Gaza. Ninety Gazans have been killed, no reports of Israeli casualties. And in that you see the disequilibrium in the current situation. Currency markets, Euro 136.02, dollar index 80.13. Japanese yen has strengthened 101.29, Swiss E.8924. Pound 171.26, the Aussie just below 94 at 93.86. 
Rupee back above 60 at 60.195. South Korean won 10.19.10. Real 2.22.10. Egyptian pound 7.15.03. And the South African rand a little softer from below 10.70 levels of 10.72.60. I'll put up a three month chart of the dollar index. Um, that still hasn't got traction yet, but there's a school of thought that we're going to see rates increase in the US quicker. Than, are currently, um, uh, than current expectations, and that will be the catalyst for a dollar rally. But until I see it get above 81, and you can see on the chart we're at 80.13, and we've been capped by that 81 level for a while, I can't get excited by it. Euro dollar 136.02, resilient as always. Dollar index, uh, as I said, 80.13. Um, Portugal, bad news came out of that. Uh, the condition of Espirito Santo International SA, which is the ultimate parent of Portugal's second largest lender, Banco Espirito Santo, which is also involved in Angola, by the way. So you have a contagion, possible contagion effect there. The parent missed some debt payments and concerns about, about its accounting. A frenzy of speculation sent the bank shares plummeting until trading was halted yesterday. Gold is at 1336.285. This is near a 16 week high, up 1% for the week. Um, and obviously, the Portuguese news uh, pushed to gold higher. Uh, this is the sixth weekly gain, longest winning streak since February, March. Crude oil finally had a bounce to 102.60. Um, and uh, I think, you know, it's a trading buy, but I thought that at 104, 105, to be frank. But I think it's, a, it's even more of a buy now. UN has evacuated dozens of foreign staff from Libya. I wrote that piece, if you get a chance, go and have a look, on the 24th of October 2011. Gaddafi's body in a freezer, what's the message, I said. Very interesting piece uh, on BD Live, it's on linked up on Rich Wrap Ups. African oil sector poser saying lack of infrastructure and skills means the cost of oil projects in Africa will be significantly higher than in other regions over coming years, according to research and consulting firm Global Data. Interesting. Mergers and acquisitions, Africa's resurgence. This is coming out of the Financial Mail. Saying deal value in the first half of 2014 is up 56%. This is globally uh, to $1.57 trillion. China and India accounted for 56% of the value of M&As in Africa in 2013, up from 13% in 2006. Topping the list in sub-Saharan Africa in 2013 was Indian Group ONGC Videshi's acquisition of a 20% stake in the Mozambique offshore gas field Ravuma Block 1 for $5.1 billion. Then Chai CNPC's $4.2 billion acquisition of a 28.6% stake in exactly the same uh, sort of gas property. Um, and talking about average deal size is around $30 million. Most potential targets are family and businesses. Uh, so basically, you know, I think the capital markets, and that's what bifurcation I was speaking about, you know, the liquidity coming into the continent continues. It's a sweet spot. It will get, it's a secular move, I think. South African all shares up 11.122% this year. Dollar rand, a little bit softer, 1072.60. Egyptian pound, 715.11 where it's been for a great deal of time. Egyptian stock market up 24.69, 77 uh, this year alone. Nigeria also up 4.1375% this year, and this is at 2008 highs. Ghana stock exchange is up 11.3286%, but the currency is down about 30%, so you've lost all that. And then I saw this story, Ghanaian soccer fans seek asylum in Brazil. Hundreds of Ghanaians who entered Brazil as tourists to watch World Cup games have asked for asylum, police in southern Brazil said Thursday. They feel they can find work and better living conditions in Brazil. My conclusions are what I wrote on the 2nd of June when I said, look at Ghana, where the president claims he's looking for a homegrown solution to a situation of his making. And frankly, there isn't one. And I think these guys are, are you know, evidence of that, very fact. Imperil survivors, a herd migrates across Chad, once home to tens of thousands of elephants. After a surge in poaching, only about a thousand remain. This is in the Smithsonian Magazine. Um, incredible article and point of fact. It's just so tragic. Default forgiven as Ivory Coast hits Eurobond sales trail. Less than four years after defaulting on $2.3 billion of bonds, Ivory Coast is betting investors are ready to give it another chance. 
They are selling $500 million of 10-year securities. Ivory Coast debt has already returned 10% of this year. Um, Ivory Coast has recovered on all fronts post-Civil War, both in terms of political stability and in terms of economic fundamentals. Uh, the target amount is reasonable. The country has strong growth prospects. And I remember on January 2011 writing about this Ivory Coast Euro bond, and it was my trade of the year. Um, and I and I was basically basically saying that you, you know that was the time to buy it. At that time, they're trading at 40 cents in the dollar. Today, we're near 100. More than half of China's foreign aid of over $14 billion between 2010 and 2012 was directed to Africa, apparently. Um, and uh, it, But however, that pales into comparison when the U.S.'s foreign aid is about $46 billion for fiscal 2015. Um, I, I like this fo uh, picture by an artist, Cyprian Toku Dagba, Guezo, 2008. Let's see if you, what you think of it. Barclays Africa. Said on Thursday, it sees first half profit rising by as much as 11%. Angola, of course, has a very deep economic relationship with Portugal and their fears of contamination. Um, there is talk of a reported bailout of the major bank risks destabilizing the financial sector and affecting the country's sovereign rating. A huge state guarantee to a major local bank is causing concern about corporate governance and has the potential to destabilize the economy. The state has set aside up to $5.7 billion for the country's second largest bank, the Banco Espirito Santo Angola, to guarantee non-performing loans worth seven, several billion dollars. As with most banks in Angola, BESA shareholders are believed to include the most senior members of the ruling party, MPLA, the government of the presidential family. Have a look. I'm going to put up uh, a, a, an image from Bloomberg of Kenya's the Eurobonds price action since issue. It's, it's rallied very, very sharply. It's really an optimal performance. And I spoke um, about this previously. I said, you know, the big point remains the deep pools of liquidity found in the global bond markets. And these were not available to Africa, but now they are. And I said, that's a game changer. That's evidenced in the bond price performance. BAT reported first half profit after tax increased 14.5%. Turnover up 11.2%. Revenue up 14%. Earnings per share up 14.5%. Interim dividend unchanged. Talking of an improved performance in the domestic market. Continue to invest in the Nairobi manufacturing hub. Beat estimates in my opinion. Dividend stock and its traction is increasing in a declining uh, interest rate environment. Interesting piece in the Wall Street Journal about Africa's challenges are tech startups, opportunities. Well worth having a read, talking about M M M M Copa, BRCK Inc., and a number of uh, very good ideas that have come out of here. Um, and I think, you know, there is a lot of in that technology space. And before it was very much, you know, sort of a system uh, built to game the world sort of grant system as it were, you know, Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation and things like that. All of a sudden you've got a very commercial angle being put on it and I think that gives me great hope about the Silicon Valley, Silicon Savannah story that we heard so much about. It was great catching up with Manoj of Samsung. I'll put up a photograph of him and myself um, and also a link to an interview he's given for mobile phone penetration. Um, he did this interview on KTN it's worth having a look at as well. Lovely fellow, and obviously I do a little bit of work for them. Most of all, I enjoy my camera, the Samsung S5, because it's really fabulous. Kenya shilling is at 87.798. It's held under that 88, 88.50 level, severally. Nairobi all share up 11.379% this year. NEC 20 down 0.6902% so far this year. The market, uh, um, you know, sort of, we're near all-time highs in the all share, but we seem to have slowed down a little bit. Um, but I think we're going to see reduced interest rates in the local markets, and that's going to be the second leg of the rally into the end of the year. Um, so I remain bullish in it, you know, and I think that's been the right call well, for quite a while now, actually. Once again, thank you for stopping by.